Thanks, Nessa. Well, good morning to you. Uh, it's good to be back after a few weeks uh, holiday and then uh, reading. I wonder how you're getting on with the, with the Olympics uh, from Rio in Brazil, eh? Uh, I imagine that some of us are already bored to tears with it and wish it was all over. Well, others, well, we just can't get enough of, of the games. We have that, um, that app on our devices every time a medal alert signals the the beeper goes on the on on the, on the device, and we're we're into the Olympics again. Yet, in in this wall-to-wall media coverage, there has been one image dominating. You know the one? This one. We see it on the screen. Christ, the Redeemer. That iconic 100 feet statue built on top of uh, the Corfogado mountains towering 2,000 feet above the teeming city of Rio de Janeiro with its six million inhabitants. The, the giant granite arms of Jesus stretching out, as you can see, powerfully towards the, the glorious beaches of Copacabana and, of course, the slum favelas below. It, it's one of the new seven wonders of the world. And thousands of people every day climb the hill to stand before the statue. One of those was the German explorer and writer, Rolf Italianda. And he wrote about his experience in this way. He, he, he imagines a poor man from one of the favelas tracking all the way up to the colossal figure and saying, I have climbed up to you, O Christ, from the, the filthy, confined quarters down there to put before you these considerations. There are one million of us in the slums of that splendid city. And you? Do you remain here at Corcovado, surrounded by divine glory? Come with me into the favelas. Live among us. Now hold that in your minds as we open our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, as Nessa read from chapter 10. And there, verse 32, they, the disciples, were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished with those who followed, were afraid. Here's someone else on a journey. In fact, it's a group of people, the disciples of Jesus. They are on their way up to Jerusalem. But that verse not only gives us a geographical reference, it also gives us some insight into the emotional state of these followers of Christ. They were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Why? Because Jesus had already told them how this journey was going to end. Twice, in fact, in chapter 8 and verse 31, in chapter 9 and, and verse 31. And yet, in spite of that, knowing the suffering and the, and, the, and the struggle ahead, Jesus is leading the way. You could see that, perhaps, in his face or in the pace that he was setting. There is this determination to embrace what was coming down the tracks to walk the road to a certain destiny. You see, here was a man on a mission, and it astonished and frightened his disciples. He's focused on that goal like an Olympic athlete. He's given every minute of, <clears throat> of the last few years of his life, eating and sleeping and, and breathing with with one thing in mind, this date with destiny in the capital city. So for the third time in Mark's gospel, there at verse 33, Jesus predicts what's going to happen. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Jesus isn't repeating himself 
for his own benefit. No, he, he, he's sharing this prospect for the third time for his disciples' benefit. They just don't seem to get it. The first time Jesus refers to his suffering and death, Peter says, no, Lord, that can't happen to you. The second time that Jesus brings it up, the disciples get into a fight amongst each other about who's the greatest. And something very similar is about to happen this time around. We call what the disciples are doing here as selective listening. When you filter out what you, what you don't want to see and hear in order to focus only on the stuff that you do. Jesus is speaking to the disciples in, in, in stereo through, through two channels. But they are only hearing the one channel. What do I mean by that? Well, look at the phrase, the Son of Man, which Jesus uses at the beginning of verse 33. The Son of Man. Jesus frequently uses that description of himself. And it's full of significance and meaning. It echoes the the, the glorious description of the powerful figure in Daniel chapter 7. It's such a key passage that it would be worth looking at it this morning. So open your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel has this vision of four great beasts, a lion, a bear, and a leopard. And they, they, they probably represent some of the, of the great human empires and civilizations which dominate the world from the beginning to the end of time. And then comes the, the final and fourth beast empire in Daniel's vision. It's a terrifying creature with with iron teeth and and ten horns. But in the vision of chapter 7 in Daniel, all these beast empires are called into the presence of this majestic figure, the Ancient of Days. And from his royal throne, he pronounces judgment upon them. He delegates executive power to one who in the vision is called the Son of Man. Read from verse, uh, verse 13 of Daniel 7. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples and nations and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, come back to Mark chapter 10. And Jesus deliberately echoes that passage. It's an unmissable reference which the disciples would have clocked straight away. Jesus self-identifies as Daniel's messianic hero. The Son of Man, the one who enjoys absolute sovereign power and glory. That's the one channel through which Jesus is speaking. But he's also speaking here through another channel. And this is the one the disciples tuned out. Listen to the second channel. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death. We'll hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him. That's the the, the second channel. For here Jesus is referencing the great Old Testament tradition about the servant of the Lord, the one who will experience humiliation and and suffering, rejection and death. It it, it appears in so many of of the Psalms and prophets but it's famously captured, of course, in Isaiah's prophecy in chapter 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. 
You see, that too is part of the road to Jesus' certain destiny. It's a journey that he makes as the glorious son of man, but also as the suffering servant of the Lord. There is an an upside and downside to his journey. Of course, many people tend to want an upside-only gospel, a gospel of glory and reward and honor now. We want the medal, but not the four years of hard work which, which goes before it. Swimmer uh, Adam Peaty, who won GB's first gold of the games, was interviewed just after his victory on the poolside. And he told the reporter, I, I, I look at this. It, it's what makes all those four o'clock in the morning training sessions worth it. All that discipline, all that loneliness, all that hard work. I, I look at this medal. So as Jesus leads the way to Jerusalem, he's saying to his disciples, let me tell you what it means for me to walk this road. And let me tell you what it means for you to follow me along this road. There is, there is no missing the implications here of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. He said it three times now. It's in very large print. I like those contracts that uh, we can sign where you simply tick the I agree box and probably never read all the small print which goes before it. You skim over all the pages, all the paperwork, and put your signature uh, at at the end. I was nearly caught out by this the other day. I, I was asked to witness an application for British citizenship. Lots of pages of the document, and we, we were just about to go on leave. I'm always happy to do that kind of thing for people uh, with passports and other documents. My signature as a minister of religion has real power, you know. It's very important. So there I was in my office, a day before going on holiday, signing this form. And I said to the person, oh, give it to me. Don't worry. I've done it all before. It won't take long. There we are, done just like that. But then for some reason, I paused. And I read the blurb before the space for my name as witness to the application for British citizenship. And these were the words that I never looked. Do not sign this application carelessly, recklessly, or incorrectly. It can mean the loss of your passport, a fine of 5,000 pounds, or even imprisonment. (laughs) Now, when I saw that, I said, hey, just let me check the details again. I've got to be really sure on this. Always read the small print. Maybe I did have an excuse that day, but the disciples didn't. And it wasn't in small print. It was in big print. The cost of following Christ was large. And folks, whenever the gospel of Jesus is truly preached, the cost of following Jesus is clear. The downside as well as the upside. But here are the disciples And they're listening selectively through one channel only, the channel of glory and power, not the channel of suffering and rejection. Now, how do we know that they were listening like that? Because of what comes next and their request for a shared glory. Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. The request comes from those two disciples, James and John, who remember, along with Peter, had experienced uh, something amazing up on that mountain of transfiguration with Jesus. Maybe James and John had enjoyed that triumph so much that they wanted more of the same. Jesus, we're not into all that suffering stuff, but we'd be up for a bit of power and glory. And Jesus, it's never too soon to reserve good seats in the coming kingdom. And you did mention Jerusalem. 
You see, for any Jew, the prophesied arrival of the Messiah, the Son of Man, in that holy city was very much believed to be the trigger for the coming of God's kingdom. It was therefore the place to be when the gongs were being handed out and Messiah took control. Hey, Jesus, we want a piece of the action on your right and left. Now, Luke, in his parallel account, in his gospel, uh, he, he omits this embarrassing episode altogether. But Matthew, interestingly, in his gospel, he does mention it and adds the presence with James and John of their mother. She runs up to Jesus and uh, she puts the case for her boys. Why would you bring your mother? It seems a bit odd, doesn't it? I guess it's true that that some mums can have very grand ideas about their kid's future. Like the mother who was pushing a a double buggy down the street when a neighbor saw the little ones inside the double buggy and asked how they were doing. And the mother replied, well, not bad, I suppose. The dentist has a little bit of a cold, but the doctor is in fine form. Parents and their children, eh? But why was the mum of these grown men there? Because this was Jesus' mother's sister. This was Auntie Salome. So the boys were playing the family card. I mean, it's got to be useful for something. But this family ambition is unbelievably insensitive to Jesus. Because the more that Jesus talked about his rejection and suffering... (laughs) the more the disciples wanted to talk about their status and security. And what about Peter, the third member of the inner circle, James and John? Well, what about him? There are only two seats up for grabs on the front row. Notice Jesus' response to James and John's rather crass request there. Verse 38, James, John, you don't know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Yeah, we can. They answered. Now, I think that these lads did understand something of the implications of Jesus' words there. The cup of judgment, the baptism of fire. Uh, They were violent images of, of, of suffering. And they were up for the fight to some extent, if that's what it would take. And Jesus confirms that in their lives, that's exactly what it would take. Verse 39, James, John, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. That's what it was going to mean for James and John to follow Jesus. James, as we know, was later executed and John was exiled. But it wasn't only their selfish ambition which troubled Jesus. It was their clueless Presumption. To sit at my right or left, James and John, is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. Their presumption that uh, in some way their suffering, their bravery could contribute to Jesus' unique sacrifice. The presumption that their courage might secure the best seats in the coming kingdom. That the kingdom of God is somehow a a, a reward for our bravery. That our place in heaven is earned by hard work or self-effort. That's the, the clueless presumption of the disciples. Can I say that when you take your place in heaven, it won't be because you have suffered more than others or displayed more courage than others, though those things may be true of you. Now, when you take your place in heaven, even if you're on the, in the 10,000th row, right at the back, away from the action at the front, you will sit down. And you will not say, oh, I wish I was down there. You will say, this is a fabulous seat. It's the best in the house. So what did the other disciples do when they learned about James and John's request? Well, they went mad. They were furious. They were indignant. 
the gospel says, not because their fellow disciples had so clearly misunderstood Jesus' words. No, they were mad because James and John had got a jump start on the seating arrangements. Now, what is Jesus going to do with all of this mess? This ugly competitiveness and self-promotion. I mean, these are meant to be the future leaders of his church. Well, it's time for the basics. It's time for class. Jesus, the gospel says, call them together. Huddle up, boys. Where are you getting these crazy attitudes from? Who are your role models? How do you pick up these things? So, to the last few verses. And the relationships in the new community. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. The, the, the big shots want people to notice, serve and honor and respect them. So they throw their weight around. They lord it over others. That may be the way relationships in society work, says Jesus. Not so with you. Not in my new community. That may be the way the world ticks, the way the office operates, the business and boardrooms are managed, but not here. Not so with you, not among my people. And here comes the countercultural community. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Greatness in the kingdom of God, says Jesus, is, is not a matter of waiting to occupy the shoes of the person above us. It's a matter of cleaning the shoes of those below us. So do you want to be great? Because there is a, a, an honor, a status, a glory which belongs to the kingdom of God. It's the greatness of service. Do you want to be great? Then, according to Jesus, be a servant. The word is the word that we might use for a, a waiter at tables. Uh, the Greek word is diakonos, a deacon. Be the person who waits at tables and serves everybody. You know how in the fancy of the restaurant you go to, the bigger the gap between the people eating and the people serving, not so with you. And at verse 44, Jesus goes even lower in the social scale to make his point. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. At least a servant, uh, uh, a diakonos, has a job, even if it's menial. But a slave, the doulos, he or she is a nobody. And yet in God's value system, the slave is a somebody, the greatest somebody. For in the new community of Jesus, we are to value people not by what they can do for us, but by what we can do for them. There's no status or rank in the kingdom of God in that sense. We are not to estimate people by the, the kind of house they live in or the car they drive or, or the job they've got. There's to be no Downton Abbey upstairs, downstairs culture in the church. No Lord and Lady Granthams who think that the rest of, of Lansdowne is really there to look after them and their family. We, we talk, don't we, a lot about service, Christian service, service in the church. Yet so many Christians seem to live by the principle, serve us, rather than service. Such self-promoting, self-advancing ambition may be what gets you to the top in the world of business or politics where you climb over everyone else on your way up the ladder of success, but it's not the path to greatness in the kingdom of Jesus. Not so with you. 
The great are not those who manipulate, who abuse their way to the top, who try to control others with their influence or wealth or position. The great are the humble servants who wait at tables and who wash feet. You can imagine the sound of of jaws hitting the ground as the disciples realize the implications of this. All these years, they had uh, they'd been getting it wrong. All these years, they had, they had the wrong heroes, the wrong models of, of greatness. But Jesus isn't done yet, is he? He has one more culture shock to give them. It's the biggest of all. At verse 45, the single most important statement of who Jesus is and of the kind of community he wants to create after referring so often to his death in the gospel, now for the first time, Jesus explains the meaning of his death. Look at it, verse 45, last verse this morning, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served. For a Jew, it was unthinkable that the great and glorious Son of Man would become a servant and slave of all. The Son of Man is meant to receive the acclaim of the world. He didn't die for it. The Son of Man is the one who is to enjoy the service of others. He doesn't give his life for them. But that's what Jesus does. For Jesus is not like other kings and rulers and great ones. He didn't come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. That's the only time in the New Testament that the word ransom is used in connection with Jesus' life and mission. The ransom was the the price paid to release a a prisoner from captivity or or a slave from his slavery. And that's what's going on in the life and death of Jesus at the cross. Jesus, the Son of Man, becomes a slave to release slaves. He gives his own life to God as the ransom price for my freedom and yours. Of course, that only makes sense to us if we understand ourselves to be in need of a Savior. If I realize that My life, like the rest of the world, needs rescuing and redeeming from the mess which my selfishness and greed and envy and bitterness creates. For without that self-awareness, we'll scratch our heads and wonder what the cross of Jesus is really all about. We'll believe that we can merit in some way the best seats in the house by our good works, because we're not that bad, by our bravery, our moral courage. So come with me again to the Olympics in Rio, to Corcovado, and the statute of Christ, the Redeemer, dominating the horizon, and to the question that the poor man from the flavella slums puts to Jesus, you Christ, do you remain up there here at Corcovado, surrounded by your glory? Come with me into the favelas and live among us. You see, that's precisely what Jesus did. The Son of Man came to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. He didn't hold on to his glory as God. He made himself nothing. He took on the nature of a servant. He came into the slums of our world. He went to the cross The one with all power uses that power to die for many. He paid my debt. The one ransom price to ransom the many. His death for my life. So let's not make the mistake that James and John made. Our bravery, our courage doesn't guarantee us seats in the front row of heaven. Heaven is the gift of God's grace to those who trust in the unique and redemptive suffering of Christ. What does the old hymn say? In my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. 
So although we cannot contribute to the redemptive sufferings of Christ, they are unique, nonetheless we are called to imitate his life of greatness. We are called to give up our lives for others. We are called to serve the least, to be the slave of all. We are called to make Jesus our hero, our model, our example, to make the shape of his life the template for ours.